It's hammer time. Why did I decide to bring this fashionable hammer that I was criticized for having this type of hammer instead of one of these big hammers? Well, the Bible, the Word of God says the Word of God is both fire and hammer. It's both of this. Well, Pastor, where's that in the Bible? I've never heard of that. Well, Jeremiah 23, 26. It's both. Hammer 23, 29, I believe. 23, 29. But anyway, the, the, the word of God is both hammer and fire. Why? The fire is to, pure, it is to purify our iniquities, our lust, our pride, our rebellious spirit, our stuff that we fall short, the fears that uh, allow us to walk in fear as opposed to walk in faith. Uh, these are also things that help us purify our nasty attitudes, our big mouths, our scenarios that just need to be purified, our anger, our stubbornness, our rebellion. The Word of God is supposed to do that. But when you keep operating in the flesh, then you're not allowing yourself to be purified by the Word of God. If you're reading the Bible but you're not applying it, then it's not doing what it needs to be. Or what it needs to do. But now the hammer, where does the hammer come into the picture? The hammer comes into the picture because it comes to create you and chip you away into the image of God and knock some things off of you because God's got to get all of you, not just most of you. He's got to get all of you. He's still doing his perfect work in me. How many of you can raise your, your hand and say, he's still doing his perfect work in you? Hallelujah. And for those of you that didn't raise your hand, we'll pray for you after service. But uh, we need you to do this. Uh, I need you to do this right now and say these words with me. Break me, Lord. Break me, Lord. In Jesus' name. In Jesus name. It's hammer time. When I say, when, when I start, let's, let's make a little fun out of this. When I, when I start doing this, just let's all together. It's hammer time. It's hammer time. By now, yeah, these are for some, for, uh, uh, this is for a lot of stubborn people too. But, uh, but the thing about it is also this, this beautiful hammer, uh, I, I know that I mentioned about the fire. The fire is uh, the Holy Spirit, fire. It comes to purify our shortcomings, our anger, our pride, uh, stuff that shouldn't belong in our journey. But the hammer is chips away on things that it needs to do. But sometimes the hammer also comes with a little screwdriver to tweak some things in us to make us better. So this special hammer, now you know why it's so special, because it's not just to chip away at you, but it's also to help you become like Christ's mind. The Word of God in a nutshell is there to renew you and renew your mind, to transform you. Because if you are confessing that Jesus Christ is Lord, but you're not changing, that means one of these two instruments is not operating in your life. And you will continue to go on being the same person as opposed to being transformed into the image of Christ Jesus. Therefore, it's, it's hammer time. So that's what the, the hammer is for. You know, like a lot of times, have you ever gone to one of these um, like um, old school farms and whatever where the blacksmith gets the fire, he gets a piece of coal, and the fire is, is already, uh, you, see, you see the coal or the instrument, the metal, it's already red, and then he gets the chisel or something. He starts like chisel while it's hot. That's what it does. Blacksmith, he gets it. You're hot, he starts chipping away. No, you, that doesn't belong in your life. You, you need to listen more and talk less. You need to do this, you need to, and he starts doing it. But, but you got to allow him to do that. Amen. You got to allow him. Because if you don't allow him, and you are already set in your ways, I don't care if you're uh, five years old or 55 or 95, you still have growth to do. And if you don't want to stay in the potter's wheel and allow him to break you, then you're going to continue to be living a life that's not really fulfilled all the time. So you need to get this thing so that we can move forward in what God has for us in our new church. Now, I wish I could keep talking about this, 
I wish I could keep talking about hammer time, but it's not. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, I, I wish I could keep. <laughs> I got to be careful. Uh, I wish we could be talking about this, but that's not the purpose of my message tonight. The purpose of the message tonight is not to, for God to chisel you. That's between you and God, and God's got to do that at you. He's got to chip away some stuff in you that doesn't belong in there anymore. But the reason why I call this, it's hammer time, is because we were awarded a church. And since we were awarded a church, work has to now be done. A lot of people are connected here. There's a lot of people connected online. As a matter of fact, most of our offerings come from our online viewers. So we thank God for you online viewers. God bless you. I don't know what we would have done without you. So, you know, I'm sure that there's a screen that goes out there that you guys give your donations. I don't know how you find it, but God bless you for your faithful giving to the ministry. Because if it wasn't for you, this ministry cannot be on the radio. It cannot move forward to all that God has for us. But the Hammer Time sermon for tonight is really for us to rise up and build a house for God. It's for us to rise up and build our own home where we can call it our home. Well, we can have the freedom. Hey, pastor, can you have a, a seminar there on Saturday about drug addiction or about this or about deliverance or about whatever? And we can be free. We don't got to go to over here. And I thank God for Granada. I thank God for Salvation Army. I thank God how we started in the house. I thank God for everything and for the small beginnings that we've been chipping away faithfully and consistently. I thank you for the open doors. But now it's time to rise up and build our own church, our own church. Hallelujah. And we were awarded this church. Praise God Almighty. Our future home. We were awarded it. We, were, well, we got it. And now I want us to go into this new church with an attitude of a servant, uh, an attitude to, that you're going to raise your family here, that your family, your kids are going to probably be saved here, that some of your relatives and your friends are going to be uh, delivered here, that you're going to have breakthrough here, that you're going to have issues in the future with relationships, and you're going to need, uh, we're going to be having rooms, that we're going to be having counseling, and we're going to have meetings, and it's going to be hours, and we don't got to ask for permission. Hey, you think you can give me Saturday for like two hours? And, and we don't got to do nothing. All we got to do is say, Let's do it. And do it. And plan and just go and do it. And quite frankly, I am very surprised that we were approved of this church so quickly. Because I recall, and I, those of you that were here on January 4th a sermon, I was preaching well, uh, New Wine. Remember the sermon about a new wine? And I was preaching about that, and I kept saying, this is the year of the miracle. This is the year. I was prophesizing. This is the year of the miracle. I, was, I kept saying that. This is the established year of the miracle. I kept saying that, and I was saying it by faith. I had nothing to show. And here we are about to, we're not even done with February, and we already got approved of our home. It came too easy. But it... It, you know, some people, some, some, somebody told me today, he goes, uh, that's because it's the will of God. No, sometimes things that are from the will of God come difficult too, because he's got to test you. It, it, it didn't just happen from January to February that God just awarded us or, or uh, approved of us getting our own church home. This has been going on since we started having, or since I started having Bible studies on March 25th, 2004. Amen. But it carried on, and then we went full-time into ministry five years ago. And now, you know, the, the chipping away and the, the consistency, because we know that consistency is the key, because I mentioned about that. And all these things, God is looking down. He's looking for servants. He's looking for people that are humble, that are praying, that are anchored up. And he's looking and saying, I can trust that servant. I can trust that son of mine. Let me bless him. And boom, it's, you know, I have nothing against storefront churches. I have nothing against churches that are in warehouses in Tamiami Airport. I have nothing against those. God bless them. They're also a church of God. But we actually got a very nice church in a prime time location, which is beyond the favor that I can ever, ever imagine. Yeah. Hallelujah. Yeah. Praise God Almighty. Praise God Almighty. 
So turn with me, please, to the book of Haggai. Haggai. That's, it's a very small book. You're going to have to go into your table of contents. Uh, it's a very small book. It's got about two chapters. Because this is like basically the repairs, remodeling, restoration of our future home. And uh, this prophet named Haggai, there's also scripture about Nehemiah when he was building, building the, the, the wall in Israel. There's also Ezra, the prophet Ezra, that was, or the high priest uh, Ezra, that was the, also building a church in the church of God. God wants us to have a church, amen? God wants us to have a church, a place that we can have home. And so, you know, this guy, hey guy, uh, the command from the Lord that came to him to build God's house, I like his attitude because he had a blessed, balanced, and complete attitude. Like a famous author that wrote this great book that, that's, that's out there if you want to check it out. Uh, that book is Haggai in a nutshell. The only difference is when he said this, it was about 25 centuries ago. And when he said what I'm about to read, uh, this prophet, he almost knew what was most important. Can we say most important? Most important. In other words, you've got a bunch of important things that you're dealing with in your life right now, but prioritizing with what's most important is wisdom. Amen. Because there's a lot of important things. I got to build the church. I got to tend to my wife. I got to honor my parents. I got I to gotta, I gotta look after my son. I got to do I got to pay the mortgage. I, you know, there's a lot of important things. I got to prepare for next week's sermon and the next week's sermon and the next week. There's a lot of important things. But I, I have learned to say, these are my priorities. God, my body, my family, my ministry, my hobbies. So I can't be focusing so much on my golf game, which I love, or my diving, which I love to do with Chip Lusco and stuff, uh, but i rather just focus on my priorities because when I got my priorities in line, my decisions are easier. And I'm not out like a chicken without a head. I, I'm focused. Well, wait a second. I want to do that, but God comes first. I want to do this, but my wife comes first. I want to do that. Everything is about priorities. And this guy, Haggai, was brilliant because he really knew what, uh, uh, what it was about prioritizing. And at that moment, he, was, he wanted to build the house of God. And he was challenging the people back then that had just been liberated to rise up and build a church for God. So I started reading in chapter 1 of Haggai uh, because you're going to see in this passage that he was focused, but many of his people were distracted. That's life right now in the 305 Miami. Many are focused and many are distracted. Why? Because they don't have their priorities in order. When your priorities are in order, you're not going to be easily distracted. And so you've got to hammer those priorities in your head so that you can make wiser and wiser decisions. So Haggai chapter 1 verse 2, I start reading, if I may, in the Word of God, New King James Version. Thus speaks the Lord of hosts, saying, this people says, the time has not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. Then the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet, saying, is it time for you yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses and this temple to lie in ruins? What does that mean, Pastor? What does it mean that, that, well, he was basically saying that these people who had just left captivity, all of a sudden they were focused on building their nice little mansion, their nice little garage homes with a pool and jacuzzi and all that, but they were dismissing the house of God. And they were distracted. So the God is telling him, hey, you really sh are you sure you want to build a house when you got all these people that are distracted? They're focusing on the material things of life. And nothing wrong with having a nice house. I like a nice house. I like my marble floors. I, li I'm, I like my, my nice little pool. I, I'm, I have a very cozy home. I, I don't need a big thing. I can live in a trailer, but I'd rather live in a house. But the, the bottom line is that I am more focused 
in what I do for the kingdom that's going to have an eternal perspective than, than rather than just do what I want to do, that when I die, it's over and done with. The rehearsal is over, and now real reality begins, which is eternal life. And so he was telling this to the people, or God was telling them to, this to Haggai. Verse 5, Now therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You have sown much, and you bring in little. You eat, but you do not have enough. You drink, but you're not filled with drink. You clothe yourselves. In other words, isn't this Miami? Amen. <laughs> you clothe yourself. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, let's go to uh, Macy's. Let's go. You clothe yourself. You, you're drinking. Let's, yeah, yeah. And, and you're never satisfied. It's never enough. And, who, and he who earns wages, earns wages to put into a bag with holes. Haven't you noticed people that are chasing the money? What happens to people that are chasing the money? They are void. They are not satisfied. Instead, why don't you learn to chase God instead? Chase God Almighty and chase your money. Nothing wrong with money. I love to have money. But the thing about it is God first. God first. God first. Verse 7. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. Go up to the mountains and bring wood and build the temple. That I may be the, that I may take pleasure in it and be glorified, says the Lord. You looked for much, but indeed it came to little. And when you brought it home, I blew it away. Why, says the Lord of hosts, because of my house that is in ruins, while every one of you runs in his own house. Verse 10. Therefore, the heavens above you withhold the dew, and the earth with, withholds its fruit. In other words, you may be chasing all these things, But in the end, it's going to slip like a bag with holes. For I, verse 11, called for a drought on the land and the mountains on the grain and the new wine and the oil on whatever the ground brings forth on man and on livestock, in other words, the animals, and on all the labor of your hands. Father God, bless his word in Jesus' mighty name. Back then, like today, many are concerned with their own needs. And, of course, we got to tend to our own needs. Uh, but many are concerned, like us, and those watching online, and those on the radio, many are focused, my needs, and not doing the will of God. As long as you're focused on my needs, and the will of God takes a third place, fourth place, second place, fifth place, you are not going to have the fruit of the land that God has for you. I know it's strong. I know it's, I know it's tough, but it's tight. The will of God for Haggai was to build a temple, a temple. This is why many suffer unnecessarily because your priorities are out of order. The, you're supposed to put God first and do his will above everything. Amen? The will of God first over everything. But we live in a society today that's more concerned about uh, self. That we're concerned about our homes. We're concerned about our cars. We're, uh, some of us are more concerned about our own lawn. I had a guy that, the, 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 I'm not going to mention his name because you guys know who he is, but, but he's cool with it. I, I told him I was going to put him on, on, on the spot. He is so focused on his lawn, and I just told him, I wonder what would happen if you would be so focused on his word And instead of your lawn, where would your mind be today? He, is all, he knows all the ingredients, all the turf builders, all the pesticide stuff, all the, exactly how to cut the lawn. He knows everything, but he went, hey, uh, do you know three books in the Bible? Do you know three Bible verses? No, no, no. Okay, but why are you a master in lawn maintenance, but you have no clue on the instruction manual for life? This is power. And when you're given something of power, let's say it's a lawnmower, let's say it's a car, let's say it's a piece of equipment, a camera that we're watching online. Whenever you're given something with power, it comes with an instruction manual. You were built by God Almighty with power. And therefore, you need the instruction manual to move forward in the right direction to make decisions that are wise in your journey. Amen? Amen. You need to do that. But we're focused on our jobs. 
we're, 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 we're focused on all these things that, that are comfortable. Comfortable. But we're not focused on doing the will of God. We look to others as opposed to looking up to him. We're not doing the will of God. And many in the church today, uh, the, the churches are filled. Oh, uh, yeah. The churches are filled. And, and, and yeah, let, let me leave it there. All right. Come on. Look on my phone. Look on my phone. Look on my But see, what happens is these days people are caught up in the building rather than you who are the church. Oh, look at that big church. Do you know that there's a lot of big churches that are out of order and not in the will of God? Oh, my God. That, that, I mean, God loves reverence, and also he cares for the house to be maintained. We are the church, I understand, but he also wants us to be in, in order with the church. There's a fine line between being his temple, in other words, his church, and representing him here on earth. We have to do both. We are the church, then we have to represent him well. Church comes from the Greek word, by the way, called ecclesia, meaning called out. Called out of what, pastor? In, in, in the Greek, which was the New Testament was written, the first, just there's a little teaching. We're going to do a lot of these on Thursdays in the new church, big time services on the Sundays. But ecclesia, which is a Greek, uh, Greek for church, it means called out. Called out of what, pastor? Called out from the world. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the, the Gospels, the first four books of the New Testament, they are called the Gospels. The Gospels are for the world. Jesus said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. For God so loved the world. The world. Not the church. For God so loved the world. He wants everybody to be saved. But now, after the world, comes the next chapters. Acts, Romans, Corinthians. And that is for the church. Ecclesia. And that means now that you are in the world, but now you're not in the world, now you're in church. Those of you that are watching and here, and now you are, have been set apart. You're not of the world anymore. Now you're supposed to be chipped away and allow the Holy Spirit to work in you and chip away because it's... And you're supposed to allow the process to happen. You're called out. You're called out of what, pastor? You're called out from the world. You're called out of sin. You're called out of darkness. You're called out of addictions. You're called out of mess. You're called out from re rebellion. You're called out from demonic influences. You're called out. And now you're supposed to be complete in Christ Jesus. You're called out of hopelessness. But now you're in Christ Jesus for him to make a difference in you. Hallelujah. We were lost, hallelujah, but now we're found. Give God some glory. We were lost, but we're found now, hallelujah. We are, call, we are now called out, but he, he, hear me closely. We are called out not to be invisible, but to be visible. To represent him, because we're the church. We belong to him. We belong to him. We must build this church that's going to be in Sunset in 127th Avenue. We must build it because everyone here, especially in Miami, we need a church. A lot of people desire a church that's not dead, that, that the herds go there. And, and you, know, you want a church also that's in order, that you're not like too fanatical where, where, where you know, the services are like six hours. You, know, you, you want to have a balance because everything is about balance. The Lord is a God of balance. But here's the thing. What I have noticed is people are following more the herd than they're following his spirit. And when you're following the herd, what's popular? Oh, let's go here. Oh, let's go there. The herd will lead you perhaps to something that's good, but not to something that's best. And so God wants us to be a church like a child needs a family. Like people need the church. Like, like a baseball player needs a team. A coach. We need a church. The Bible says, let us not forsake the gathering together. Let us not forsake this. 
well, I'll watch it online. Online is the exception. We're supposed to not forsake this gathering right here. And, and this gathering, the meeting of the minds, the meeting of the soul, the togetherness, the fellowship. This is what God wants. The Let us not forsake the assembly of the saints. Let us not forsake gathering together. This doesn't mean happy hour. This means getting together in the spirit and growing and growing and growing. That I can build you up and you can build me up. I can give you a word of encouragement and you can give somebody else a word of encouragement. That we are all connected with the fire of the Holy Spirit and that fire takes us to what the word has to bring and eventually it's going to be hammer time for you to be chipped away from some things that don't belong in your life. Iron Hallelujah. Iron sharpens iron. Praise the Lord. So I got four things here on this thing called the hammer time plan of action. The hammer time plan of action. Because we're going into that new church. We're going into that new church. We're already, no, we're already there. It's going to be four or five months. I don't know when. I, I really don't know yet. But the process has started. Tomorrow the water is going to be turned on because the church hasn't been active in four years. So when you are going to go, thank you for putting that slide, media team. Can we give Sally a hand over there, please? Yeah, she's amazing. She, she is one of the Rise Up Outreach most faithful and enthusiastics. God bless her. Anyway, uh, that's the church. There's a lot of cow dung around the area that's going to be cleaned up before the 23rd. But we're going to have to uh, go in there and clean up. Those trees are going to be trimmed by the time we go there. And, and everything is going to start looking spick and span. The water is going to be turned on tomorrow. I, I, I just found out where the water was and all this. Everything's going to be turned on tomorrow with the water. Well, we, we got the, I mean, remember, the church has been inactive for four years. So when you go there on the 23rd to help out, let me see a show of hands. How many of you are going to help on the 23rd? Wow, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Well, when you go there, don't be shocked with the spider webs. Don't be uh, shocked with the little stench. All that's going to go away. Just get ready to hammer time. So number one, this hammer time plan of action for our new church. Thank you, Lord, Holy Spirit. Set your mind to help. I already asked for a show of hands. I got more than I expected. Praise God. I love when that happens. Second Chronicles 24.4. It says, now it happened after this, that Joash set his heart on repairing the house of the Lord. Verse 13. So the workmen labored. In other words, we're going to be laboring. We're going to be sweating. Even my son who's watching online says, Dad, I want to be a part of that. He got his ticket yesterday, and he's coming on the 23rd to help out. If you, don't have, if you haven't seen a work ethic, you're going to see a tremendous work ethic in my son. He will be the first one there and the last one to leave. He will be sweaty. He will be disgusting. But I'll tell you one thing. He's got a tremendous work ethic, and he's not going to leave until the work is done. So the workmen labored, and the work was completed by them. They restored the house of God to its original condition and reinforced it. And that's what we're going to do. Now, let me warn you about something. There never, let me be nice. There never has been a building project like we're about to do. There never has been a building project that one has not received opposition. It doesn't exist. There's never been a building project for the church that we're about to get in in four or five months, three months, six months, whatever that time is. I don't have a date. I'll know when. I'll know when everything is spick and span. I'm not just going to go in and there's no air conditioning. No, no, no. We're going to go and, and be nice and be comfortable. But there has never been a building project for the kingdom of God that's never been attacked, that's never been with spiritual warfare that's never been with opposition or resistance or rebellion or stubbornness. There's never happened. So the warning that I want to give you right off the get-go is everything looks great not right now. Like I mentioned on January 4th, we had new wine, new season. And I said from right this pulpit right here, I said, hey, this is going to be the year of the miracle. And a month later, a month and a half later, we got to church. I didn't expect it to be that fast. I expected September, but God, you know, that's why when people told me when, I go, I don't know. But all I know is going to happen before the end of 2019. Well, it happened. It happened sooner than I expected. But now that we are, uh, there are some people 
that don't want us to have this church. There's some people that have probably said some things about this ministry or about you, or about your pastor or whatever, that they will stick stubbornly to their opinion to see you fail to say, I told you. That's a prideful, demonic-influenced spirit. There's people like that. You know that. I mean, maybe you don't. Maybe you're living in a little glass house, but there's people that really, uh, I don't think I have any enemies. I have people that don't like me. That's life. But, uh, you know, but uh, the thing about every time you're doing something great, you're going to have people. Billy Graham was uh, one of the greatest evangelists ever, and he had his haters. So everybody, Jesus had his haters. Everybody, I'm not even worried about that. But the problem that I'm seeing is that people get like, like gelatin when spiritual warfare comes. So I'm warning you right here as your brother, your friend, your pastor, that we're going to be attacked because it's just the devil is too predictable. He's, he's not going to have it, uh, us to have it that easy. But in the name of Jesus Christ, we shall be victorious and we shall win. Rise up. Directly or indirectly, directly or indirectly, we're going to be attacked in some way or another. But it's there from the enemy to frustrate you. Don't let it frustrate you. There's going to be people that are going to be doubting. But how are you going to do that? But how are you going to do that? Hey, hey, this is faith. Everything's already happening. Well, we have been given that. If I were to tell you some of the details about this agreement that we made, this contract, you're like, who in the right mind would make a contract like that? But we have made an agreement and we feel the presence of God. The, the owner's daughter is going to be attending our services. The owner's son is going to be attending our services. The owner is going to be attending our services. This is all teamwork partnership scenario. Give God the glory because only he can put something together as such. Hallelujah. So we're going to be working on the temple like Haggai was doing in about 535 before Christ. But when he was that passage that I read to you, when he was giving the order to, to start building the temple, there was a lot of pauses. Why? Because they were being attacked. And there, several times, there were satanic attacks on the building project. And in other words, the, the building project halted because of the attacks that were, that were being given to him. He, and the devil wants to see us defeated, but I'm here to tell you, what is mentioned in the New Testament, the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church of Jesus Christ. The gates of hell, he will not prevail. Stick your feet on cement, stand your ground, and watch God glory be done. Because this is the year of the established miracle. And this is just the beginning of a miracle of many, 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 many more years to come. But it's now time to roll up our sleeves because it's... Man, you see, that tax already started. That could have been a little, my head. <laughs> oh, Lord. But... um. The sad truth is that much of the church world these days are deceived. And the culture of the kingdom has been lost. What do you mean, Pastor, by the, by the culture of the kingdom of God that has been lost? Everybody's focusing on the hype, on the entertainment, on the, on the beauty of the church. Oh, they got 5,000 people. They're focused on all the things rather than focus on whether they're growing in the Lord as disciples. But there's a lot of stuff. Everything is connected there. They're, they're, they're putting Jesus like a Hollywood Jesus, as opposed to a Jesus that came and died for our sins in a brutal way. So the second thing, besides the mind that needs to be in place, we need to set our hands to help. Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 18 says, And I told them of the hand of my God, which had been good upon me, and also of the king's words that he had spoken to me. So they said, let us rise up and build. Then they set their hands to do this good work. 
Basically, what, what that verse says, just do it. Let's just do it. Let's just do it. It, it took Noah 120 years to build the ark. Was he getting criticism? Was he getting opposition? Yes. Okay, well, and, and so let's just keep doing it. Let's just keep doing it. It, it, it happened to Noah. It has going to happen to us. Uh, such and such left. Oh, Eddie, but such and such left. Okay. Uh, the funds are low. Okay. Uh, the, the doubts are increasing. Okay. Uh, but we also have a great and mighty God that he, the Bible doesn't say that, that the weapons are not going to come. The weapons are going to come against us. They're just not going to prosper. And you got to anchor yourself that they're just not going to rise up to where they're going to frustrate us and halt us back permanently why are they not going to do that to us because we are operating in the perfect will of god assigned by god almighty and he's right by our side praise god almighty so people will hold you back insecurity will visit there will be fear among us but we must continue to rise up because it's you know in the old days when i was raised uh, by my parents in the christian church uh, people would leave the church, and a lot of times uh, they would leave the church convicted by the Holy Spirit. These days, people leave the church because you didn't shake their hand, because you didn't pay attention to one of their things, because you didn't go visit the aunt. Like one lady got on my case for not visiting her aunt. I go, if I were to visit everybody's aunt here, I would have no time to myself. But... These days, we can't be focused on some of these uh, ultra-sensitive scenarios, easily offended scenarios. We have to continue hammer time because change comes uh, to, to the church, and we're going to be a church that's going to be anchored. We're going to be a church that you're not going to be coming in the same way. You're, when you're going to be coming in, I'm already expecting that you're going to be delivered that day. I'm expecting that you're going to leave out those doors that if you have a, a, a cigarette addiction, if you have a drug addiction, a porn addiction, whatever you have, I believe that we can pray and anoint your head with oil and put hands on you like the Bible says and not hold back because we don't want to offend anybody, but we're going to come with the power of the Holy Spirit. I believe there's going to be a lot of change, deliverance, and we're going to see miracles, signs, wonders, and healings in our church, and we're going to continue to see it where people are going to say, hey, man, that church... They are in the Word of God. They are in the will of God. Hallelujah. But we got to be bold. We got to be bold. The Spirit of God is bold. Uh, Jesus, John the Baptist, Peter, Apostle Paul, they all spoke with boldness. They didn't spoke this sugar-coated gospel. Oh, be careful. Don't say that. You're going to offend them. No, they spoke with boldness. And... Uh, there's a lot of uh, people that are focused on these high-end pastors. Jesus is really the only way. Our eyes should be just on Jesus. Let God decide whatever they want, but keep your eyes on your only focus. Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, Almighty God. So instead of elaborating yourself on large numbers, oh, we had about 5,000 people in this church. Instead of elaborating on, on, the, on the amount of people that come to church, instead of elaborating on the buildings, instead of elaborating on all these things that have nothing to do with being in the perfect will of God, elaborate and examine yourself. Are you in the perfect will of God? Is your pastor in the perfect will of God? And is the church growing to become disciples of the word of God? Because that's really what he wants. It's the ABCs right now that this world is confused. The ABCs. What do you mean by that, Pastor, by the ABCs? Attendance, building, and cash. If there's a big attendance, they must be in the will of God. No, there's a lot of false religions that have a huge, huge attendance. Let's go to the Vatican. We'll know what we're talking about. B, we have buildings. Oh, they have a big building that must be in the will of God. There's a lot of false religions that have big buildings. There's a cash flow in that church. Oh, people give mega offerings. That church has so much money. 
There's a lot of false religions that are loaded with cash. They're not in the will of God. So ABCs of what the world wants to portray as being a successful church is not necessarily a successful church. A successful church in the eyes of God, not in the eyes of man, in the eyes of God is a church that embraces Genesis to Revelation. It's all in for God and is helping people rise up to the next level from glory to glory to glory to glory. Not staying the same, not going in and leaving out with no change you've made confession you know the word but the spirit of God is not deep in you both have to be in you the spirit and the word of God when both are in you you're going to be one powerful man or woman of God for his kingdom glory hallelujah 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 number three some people are going to leave going to leave early but that's okay number three set your offerings to help Set your offerings to help. You know, we have to trim the trees. We have to change the carpet. We're going to be putting an altar in this color, more or less. I got pictures if you want to see what, what we have in mind. We're going to have an altar like this. We're going to take that 40-year-old carpet and throw it away. We're going to do some changes. We're going to have a nursery for your baby. We're going to have a, a children's place. We're going to have a storage place. We're going to have a kitchen. Okay, it has a little formica now. It's 1981. But you know what? Please trust me with this. My wife will tell you. I'm not cheap, but I'm frugal. I don't like to be ridiculous cheap, but I'm frugal. I don't waste my money. I don't like to waste my money. I don't want to waste what we have accumulated all these years now. And the offerings that are coming in, I don't want to use them. Oh, let's just put granite. Oh, let's just put granite. No, right now... We don't have chairs. We need to order 140 chairs. I sat down with Pastor Bob Coy, and we had a two-hour lunch, and we talked for 45 minutes about chairs, <laughs> about what to buy. And, and because you have furbished uh, uh, chairs that cost a lot, that are brand new. You have chairs that have been around for like five years that have been used, but they're still in good condition, like these chairs right here. And so, you know, we got... You know, I'm not going to be buying the most expensive. I'm not going to be buying the ones where you're going to be getting a backache. But I'm going to be buying something in the middle there somewhere. The formica can live for now. The bottom line is right now, we need to have functional bathrooms. We need to have the, 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 the things cut. We need to leave things like they are. And we need to be frugal about it and just get in. And once we're in, then we start changing and uh, improving and putting uh, baseboards. And, and if you want to put uh, crown moldings, that's fine too. But for right now we're going to be frugal because what I, what I don't want to do is put all my money into stuff that's irrelevant and then all of a sudden we're short on chairs and people have to stand priorities and we need your offerings to help us out to this uh, show and I'm going to be showing you where these proceeds are going to be going to where they're going to how we need a new paint job the paint is 1981. We got to change it. We got to put a nice little fence. We got to put a nice asphalt uh, exit, which the owner is going to pay. But we're, we're coordinating. You know, I'm like, hey, you, you got to clean this over here. The, hey, the AC is your responsibility. And, 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 but he's working with me when I'm working with him. But if I can save money, I'm going to save it. Because the bottom line is we need to have all of our funds there and not be all of a sudden running out and we're like oh my god when then i gotta collect three offerings like some pastors do this is not gonna happen here help us lord help us lord help us lord we're gonna collect one offering each sunday and if that offering is not enough oh well and in that one offering i'm trusting jehovah jireh my provider your provider, that he's going to say, hey, he's going to speak to somebody and say, hey, count me in. I'm going to pay for the 140 Amen. chairs. Hey, count me in. I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm, I'm the one that's going to be putting the lighting. Hey, count me in. We need a mixer for the, for the media team. Count me in for that uh, $1,000 item. Uh, count me in for I don't know how it's going to happen. But I'm not going to have you stand on your chairs. Again, let me have 10 people that are going to give $1,000. Stand on your chairs. Oh, they're going once, going twice, going three times. Going, no, I'm not going to have that. <laughs> We're going to collect one offering in each service. And if God's spirit doesn't speak to you, then so be it. But if God's spirit speak to you, you obey, you trust him by faith, and let God multiply the seed that you're sowing. 
But I don't want to be one of these right now. Oh, we're going to collect an offering for the church and we're going to collect another offering for the building fund. No. One offering. We're going to have a garage sale. People that don't even come to our church are already donating stuff for the garage sale that all the proceeds are going to go for the building fund. If God doesn't speak, I don't move. I am not going to manipulate anybody like a car salesman. I am not going to do that kind of stuff. I've already experienced that in other churches before, and I'm not going to go through that anymore. I am going to just be faithful, putting my eyes on him and trusting him, and if the funds are not there, then that means it's not time to throw that money away yet. But I don't want people leaving here and saying, Christianity, all these people, all they want is your money. I don't want to hear that. But you need to be obedient to tithing and offering. FYI. Okay. The book of Ezra, chapter 2, verse 68. If we can put that up there, please. Some of the heads of the families, this is the book of Ezra, 268. Some of the heads of the families, when they came to the house of the Lord, that is in Jerusalem, made free will offerings. In other words, they were not manipulated. They were not coerced. They were not forced. Did he make you feel guilty? They, it was free will. Can we say free will? Free will. free will offerings for the house of God to erect it on its site. Verse 69. According to their ability, according to their ability. There's some people that make good money. There's some people that, are, that are, they just have enough to, to pay the rent. They gave to the treasury of the work 61,000 dairies of gold, 5,000 minas of silver, and 100 priests of garments. I don't want your garments. You can keep them, but we do need your gold and your silver. So instead of having a church with more meetings, more offerings, which I really don't want, uh, well, let's change the song so we can attract uh, uh, different people. Let's bring in these big speakers. Uh, uh, none of that stuff changes life. The Holy Spirit comes like a fire and it changes you it's like a, a horse with a carriage or a horse with a cart if the horse is unhealthy what point is it to decorate the cart all nice with bumblebee colors and all kinds of if the horse is unhealthy what's the point of decorating the cart let us get healthy in the Lord spiritually, physically, and emotionally, and in other words, in our soul, and then let the cart take us to wherever it needs to go. But what's happening is people are decorating the carts, and we're unhealthy inside. Not just physically, but also with our souls, our emotions, our minds. We're caught up in junk that we couldn't be, that, that don't belong in our journey. Instead of being free and delivered, we're oppressed and in bondage. And what I desire for all of us is to be not beggars or manipulators, or I don't want a church that's trying to manipulate you. Well, now we're going to collect the second offering of the night. And, and no, I don't, I don't want you to bring your, your sister or your brother or your relative or your friend. And all of a sudden, they're like, oh, yeah, all, all the time, ah, you know, no, I don't want that. One offering. Can we say one offering? One offering. One offering. The rest is going to be work. The rest is going to be hammer time. hammer time, garage sales and whatever it needs to be. Look at 2 Kings chapter 12. 2 Kings chapter 12, verse 4. And Jehosh said to the priests, all the money of the dedicated gifts that are brought into the house of the Lord, all these things are biblical, guys. Everything that I'm saying here is not like, you know, uh, but we're going to be a house of order aligned to the word of God. All the money of the dedicated gifts that are brought into the house of the Lord, each man senses money, each man's assessment money, and all the money that is a man purposes in his heart to bring into the house of the Lord. Verse 5. Let the priests take it themselves, each from his constituency, and let them repair the damages. We've got a lot of damages to repair. Let it repair the damages of the temple, the church, wherever any, wow, that word, dilapidation is found. What is that word? Can anybody tell me? Augie, Mr. Uh, word, that's a word for you. Can you figure it out? Bad shape. Why am I not surprised that you knew this? A lot of these people were cheerful givers. 
But a lot of them were, they preferred slavery than being in the will of God. And a lot of them, they, they, they're not operating in the spirit of uh, generosity. The refusal of those who didn't give was a symptom also. It was a symptom. It was a spiritual problem. When you don't give to the house of God, but yet you can buy clothes and spend money and happy hours and whatever, something is not right spiritually. God had blessed them abundantly with material things in, in the book of Haggai, and they ended up, that what, what was happening with a lot of these people is they love the gift more than the giver. And we're supposed to love the giver more than the gifts. Otherwise, we are out of order. So why do some people give freely and others don't? In this church and in those days, it all depends on how much you love the Lord. It all depends on you cheap. It all depends on you robbing the Lord. But I know that those that love the Lord, like I do, I don't have any problem sowing into God's kingdom. I don't have any problem whatsoever. And I want to be one of the biggest givers of our ministry because whatever I get, I'm going to give 10% back to the Lord, sometimes 15 and 20, because I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor my seed, Andrew Michael Alonzo, or my wife, or my, my, my descendants begging for bread. I will be faithful. You trust the Lord and not trust in yourself anymore. Number four, hallelujah. To wrap it up, the last one, number four. In the, the hammer time, the, and what's needed for this thing of hammer time, hammer time building project, number one, we mentioned we got to set our minds to help. Number two, we got to set our hands to help. Number three, we mentioned that we got to set the offerings to help. We can't be cheap, guys. One thing is being frugal, but you can't disobey God. When you disobey God, you're only hurting yourself. And I hate to see people that I have the solution for you. The word has the solution for you. And you're trying to outsmart what God has already written. Yeah. Like me in a discussion last night with a lady. And she's like, well, it's my opinion this, it's my opinion that. Opinions don't really matter with something that's already written. Right. It doesn't really matter. Just obey and set yourself free and, and get the best of the land has to offer for you. Because you are powerful, and every powerful object, every powerful person needs an instruction manual. And lastly, set your spirit in unity to help. In other words, let's be together in this. Let's be in harmony with this. Our responsibility is simply our response to God's ability. And Psalms 133, 1 says, Behold, how good and pleasant it is. When brothers and sisters dwell in unity. Let's be together, guys. We're going to give instructions, by the way, as the day gets closer. Maybe next week or the week after. And what we're going to do on March 23rd, if we can put that slide up, uh, media team, the March 23rd slide, we're going to coordinate what we're going to do. It's not a cleaning day. It's a junk throwaway day. The cleaning day will come later because the, the house, the church has termites and we need to put a tent over it that's going to be paid by the owner. Once, the, once all, all that stuff is cleaned out and the, then now it's Windex and Pledge and, and mopping and all that stuff. We're not going to do any mopping. It's going to be, this is junk, throw it away. We're going to have a big dumpster out there and we're going to throw all the garbage that we can away. And then what's salvageable, what's, what's junk, but we can get some money for it, we'll use it for the garage sale two weeks later. So the, in conclusion, the question that I want to ask for you is, can we build a great church in Kendall for the glory of God? Amen. Yes or not? Another question is, can God build a great church through us? For his glory. Because this is going to be life changing. I see more than just a church. This is going to be something else. An extension of something else. The revival is not going to be in the upper room anymore. The revival is going to be right there in our premises. Old Billy Graham style. So the truth of the matter is that... God can get his spiritual hammer, and God can do this house of God all by himself.
but he always chooses man to help out. But he can do it if he wanted to. He can do it. He can do whatever he pleases. He's God. But God doesn't like to do things alone, so he invites us to go and help us out. He always chooses to work through human beings to accomplish his ultimate purpose. So it's time to roll up our sleeves. Let us rise up and build. Let us get ready to get a little dirty and a little sweaty. You're not going to get hurt. You're not going to die. Because we got a house to build for the kingdom of God. We got a house to build for the kingdom of God. It's hammer time in Jesus' name. Thank you for joining us. I pray and hope that tonight's message was well rooted in your soul. You know, this ministry has been given a God-given vision for our community right here in Miami. It's a vision that's going to be called Rise Up Outreach Center. That's going to be helping teens with their teenage issues. It's going to be helping relationships that are struggling, uh, people that are struggling with addictions, uh, all kinds of scenario. For more information, just visit our website right now. But what we need is your support for this vision. This vision is going to be costly. It's going to take a lot of manpower. It's going to require a lot of resources. And you know what? We need you. The gospel is free, but in order to advance it, requires resources. The kingdom of God, in order to be impacted further, requires people to step up and give, requires people to step up and work. The information to give is right there on your screen. You can also go to the website under Donate and give through that channel as well. Thank you for your support. God bless you, and I'll see you next Thursday.